GM everyone. Hope you had a wonderful weekend. Uh, welcome to another GCR workshop series. For those who are new here, uh, GCR work series is a community lead event series about different topics covering everything from global news, economy, politics uh, to crypto and uh, Web3. Uh, today, with pleasure, we will be hearing from Brandon Trump, who leads product and uh, partnership at uh, Zeta Chain. <laughs> For those who don't know, Zeta Chain is uh, a decentralized blockchain and smart contract platform uh, built for uh, omnichain interoperability. Hi, Brandon. Thanks for being here. And uh, yeah, please uh, feel free to share more about your background and also I know Zeta Chain. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you for having us on. Um, yeah, she mentioned. I'm going to be talking about data chain, a uh, new L1 focused on interoperability. Kind of walking through what the issues are that we have seen over the past few years and how data chain is aimed at solving those issues, particularly interoperability, multi chain, cross chain, that fun stuff. Uh, yeah, so this is just a team overview. Uh, team has a pretty strong background. Um, varying from academia to more centralized crypto like Coinbase. Um, our founder was early at Coinbase and also went on to create basic attention token, um, academics, uh, other crypto, and also uh, a variety of different Web3, Web2 experiences across the team. Um, and yeah, so crypto is becoming multi-chain. Um, over the past few years, that's become fairly obvious. There's a lot of new L1s, L2s, particularly for the Ethereum ecosystem. And uh, with the growth of all of these different blockchains or networks, uh, we're kind of seeing the need for some sort of interoperability between them um, for a more seamless experience for users, um, and then also more access to liquidity across the board for different applications and developers building wherever they might be building. So yeah, um, progression of multi-chain so far is, yeah, we've seen the increase of L1s and L2s, which are mostly by nature closed systems, um, and then centralized exchanges initially acting as a sort of bridge between those where have these new blockchains, centralized exchanges integrate with them, let you deposit funds into their system, and you can withdraw into a different system if you want. Um, a more decentralized system built kind of uh, in lieu of that is pairwise bridging. So specific chains will have bridges built for them, say Bitcoin to Ethereum, or specific assets from Ethereum to Solana, that sort of thing. And um, I won't go into too many of those examples, but they have varying security models, uh, ranging from very centralized, where it's basically just someone's server acting as that bridge, almost like a centralized exchange, um, or something more decentralized with uh, more verification guarantees and things like that. Um, and then when you have all of these or all of these bridges for different assets for different chains, uh, we've also seen a new layer on top of that uh, bridge aggregators. So things like um, Lee Finance and Socket that just act as a layer or an interface where you can pick and choose what bridge you want to use, or it can help you choose what bridge you want to use depending on what trade or uh, transfer you want to make between blockchains. Um, and then more recently, the past year or so, uh, we've seen the introduction of cross-chain messaging. So protocols like Layer Zero, Axler, um, Seller, that let you send messages and uh, sometimes forms of value between different blockchains, um, Kind of hinging on smart contracts for existing blockchains to send messages between them. So yeah, current multi-chain solutions so far, uh, particularly 
facing users uh, are pretty high risk. Um, we've seen a lot of bridge hacks over the past couple of years, a lot of value lock that was lost or had to be recovered or recompensated for uh, things like wormhole. Um, and then, as I said, with the bridge aggregators or bridges, they end up creating a pretty fragmented user experience and that goes in a few directions. So just your assets, um, just understanding what is where, what a wrapped token is, for example, all of that, what bridge I want to use is very confusing for a user. And um, it's also restrictive. So um, developers have to commit to a specific bridge or build their own sometimes to achieve certain cross-chain functionality. And with messaging, it's getting a bit better, but messaging has proven to be fairly complex once you get to non-super, I, I guess. It, it works for certain applications, but not um, certain applications that need state synchronization and things like that. So it's pretty restrictive, and that ends up bubbling up to the user being restrictive in what you can do, even when, with technically cross-chain um, messaging. Um, it gets murky. And yeah, so what people think interoperability is, is these cross-chain swap bridges, having an application deployed on a bunch of different chains, or just wrapped tokens. And just looking at that and the state of things right now in omni-chain or cross-chain, it is fairly restricted um, in where people have their heads at. It's mostly for the DEX application. Um, and when we're thinking about what interoperability can be, uh, at least how we're imagining it at Zeta Chain is a way to abstract network for users altogether. In a lot of cases, um, having games and applications and marketplaces that really span all of the chains um, rather than being just a couple of chains or having limited functionality between different chains or having to rely on a specific chain for um, kind of like a central settlement layer. Uh, when we're thinking full interoperability, it's something along the lines of I can pay from and receive into any wallet or any asset, whether it's fungible, non-fungible, um, no more wrap tokens, um, again, abstracting that network layer in a lot of use cases, and then for more enterprise use cases, uh, omni-chain and multi-chain is pretty difficult to account for right now. A lot of the bridges aren't super transparent, so when you're trying to do, I guess, omni-chain portfolio management on-chain, it's not very straightforward, and having that sort of tooling will be really powerful for people trying to do operations across many L1s and L2s moving forward. Yeah, uh, us looking at those goals for interoperability, uh, we have kind of seen there's a gap in tooling uh, for building omni-chain applications, and namely their gap in, uh, yeah, just you have messaging, but there is another space that we're calling omnichain smart contracts where you can deploy logic that, or like an EVM smart contract that can orchestrate data and value between all connected chains um, from a single place. And that differs from messaging where it's more asynchronous, um, event-driven, and requires contracts being deployed on every single chain, um, which can increase the complexity for a lot of use cases. Yeah, so Zeta Chain is the decentralized blockchain uh, and smart contract platform built for interoperability first. And this is 
chain agnostic interoperability. So it can connect to any chain um, using something called threshold signature schemes um, that started to pick up some more steam over the past couple of years. But um, yeah, at a high level, it was able to read and sign transactions on external chains, regardless of if they are smart contract platforms or not. So yeah, this is an overview of the feature set of Zeta Chain. Again, it's those two pillars, on chain smart contracts, and then messaging. The way Zeta Chain's nodes are architected is they are able to read relevant, app, or relevant transactions from external chains and then write to those external chains in a similar way. Um, and then the transactions that flow through Zeta Chain are basically atomic and uh, they support reverting if something fails on a destination and things like that. It's built on Cosmos SDK and Tendermint consensus. So it's um, architecturally similar to something like uh, EVM most Evmos, I think that's the name. Um, so it supports EVM compatible smart contracts, but is based on the Cosmos SDK underlying. And yeah, so I think we could do another entire talk on security, but high level it uses a TSS um, to sign transactions. So the key that's being used to sign the transactions is never known by a single party. It's decentralized among the uh, validator network. And combined with uh, a variety of um, infinite minting checks um, across the flow of cross-chain messaging and um, calling transactions on Zeta chain that enact things on external chains, uh, the risk profile is uh, minimized for uh, developers and users. So when you are sending value through Zeta chain, um, the only time that it's at risk is during the course of the transaction, once it's settled on native assets. So there's no susceptibility of a bridge hack like wormhole where you have a vault that is um, hacked or compromised in some way and drained. So it doesn't create new wrapped assets and um, only really uses native assets on external chains. And following up with that, the uh, way Zeta Chain works is it can custody your external native chain assets for the course of the transaction and then output them to wherever you need. So. Um, when you deploy a smart contract on Zeta Chain, it could control something like Bitcoin and Dogecoin, um, just the same as Ethereum, ETH, or Polygonmatic, or USDC on one of these chains, and uh, orchestrate them together as if they were all ERC-20s. So um, that's really powerful. It really gives you really unlimited creativity as a developer operating as if all assets were all on one chain, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, it's a simpler and more powerful dev experience than the cross-chain tooling right now with the introduction of smart contracts. So um, yeah, happy to answer any questions you guys have on the difference between these two features, but high level, uh, depending on the application you need to build or what architecture um, you want to adopt. Messaging could make sense, especially if you have an existing application that is deployed on a few chains and you just want to pass data between those contracts. Um, that makes sense for messaging. A lot of the times if you want to build something new, um, lower fee because it's just one, uh, one transaction on Zeta chain really, smart contracts make a lot more sense for those. Uh, especially when you need to manage assets across three or more chains. So yeah, it's what we're imagining is a new era of interoperability where you have the full choice of how you want to build. Um, doesn't really matter 
what chain or what network uh, an application is on, unless, of course, you're focused on, you know, I guess, reaping the benefits of a specialization of a specific blockchain, which is encouraged. Um, but you have full freedom to decide how you want to build. And these illustrations are just a demonstration of the difference of building with messaging versus omnichain smart contracts. So if you wanted to build something like a Curve for multiple assets, Bitcoin, Ethereum, USD, USD or USDC or something like that, all in a pool, to do this with messaging, you would have to manage these assets on each chain, broadcast messages to every connected chain that is managing these assets um, whenever something is happening to maintain that same curve logic. And in addition to this, you can't add logic to something like Bitcoin. But with Omnichain smart contracts, you can do this very simply, really just by deploying a curve equivalent and then inputting the specific assets you want to manage um, in this case, ETH, BTC, BUSD. So it significantly lowers the time to getting something out there, especially given you can stand on the shoulders of giants um, in the EVM ecosystem already. And you can easily just sprinkle in that input output for native external chain assets. And yeah, this is just a quick example. And this is also in our docs. Um, yeah, if you wanted to do a cross-chain swap of Bitcoin and Ethereum, both native, uh, what you would do is have a Uniswap deployment on Zeta chain and then have something that um, uses that pool um, infrastructure to swap Bitcoin against Ethereum directly. And this is an overview of how it compares to other L1s. So high level, as I said before, you could imagine Zeta Chain kind of like Cosmos or Polkadot, where it is an interoperability ecosystem um, of an L1, but it is chain agnostic. So it is not bound to parachains or just IBC. Uh, and then it also, in turn, supports omnichain smart contracts that can orchestrate Bitcoin vaults. Um, and yeah, if you compare it to something like ThorChain, uh, you can imagine it kind of like ThorChain. Oh, and also sorry if I am missing questions. Oh, that's just Jonathan. It's just it's with me, yeah. Um, yeah, so ThorChain is uh, kind of an application specific version of Zeta Chain, so focus purely on the DEX application. Um, so it supports that, orchestrating native assets um, in a similar way. Uh, but on the flip side, you can imagine you can build ThorChain using or just deploying kind of a Uniswap equivalent on Zeta Chain. And then bridges and messaging are kind of the earlier versions of this or earlier tooling for this where it's mostly application or asset specific or chain specific and doesn't get into the general smart contract logic that L1s support. And this is an overview of where we're at. So we just launched a testnet v2 the past month. That was the launch of Omnichain smart contracts and Bitcoin support. Um, and then prior to that, we had launched an initial test net with messaging. Moving forward into the next year, uh, we're targeting mainnet one Q2 um, and then launching with a few partners, which is really exciting. Um, so far on the test net, we've had, I believe, over 600K users helping us test and test different features on data chain. Um, yeah, I, I haven't checked the latest numbers, but I believe over 2.4 or 2.5 million cross-chain transactions, which is kind of a lot. 
um, pretty exciting. So uh, yeah, we're super excited about the community growth and it seems like people are really resonating with what Zeta Chain is building towards. And as we get to mainnet and launching with some pretty exciting partners and I don't know, maybe some new partners from this chat too, uh, I think it'll be really cool to see the sorts of applications in UX we can achieve um, where, yeah, hopefully it really is just stupid simple for a newcomer coming into crypto. That's kind of the the vision, the uh, end state we're imagining. And yeah, so opportunities for developers or companies uh, in omni-chain space that we're seeing, and this is just a short list, is DAOs, so being able to manage assets and governance uh, and organizations across all chains in a simple way. Uh, NFTs, there have been some inklings of omnichain NFTs, but I don't think it's really reached fruition. Memberships and marketplaces that are on all chains, the ability to prove ownership of existing NFTs across all chains, that sort of thing. DeFi is something we went into previously. Uh, so deploying these DeFi primitives, but making them omnichain will be a huge initial step and um moving beyond that I, I think there are a lot of really interesting applications in DeFi that have been bound to single chains that can be translated to omnichain to make um the ability to find an opportunity take advantage of it as a user um, earning yield or what have you uh will be a lot more seamless and approachable and identity is a big one where you have ENS um, or domain equivalents on other chains, but they're still pretty fragmented. But you can imagine a world where you have an ENS equivalent. Say the chain in an omnichain smart contract system where it can read and write as a single username like at Bob. Um, and then being able to receive into any chain Bob uh, would be really cool. And then that also goes into uh, decentralized smart contract wallets that are omni chain as well. So being able to stack transactions, uh, automate transactions, a lot of really interesting stuff there for users, uh, but also across all chains. So a user doesn't even have to worry about what network something is happening on. And then, as I said before, also uh, multi-chain portfolio management, both for users and for enterprise. Um, we're currently working with a number of developers providing resources, uh, technical support, all of that to them to help build this future of Omnichain we're imagining. Um, we have a few really exciting partnerships that have and have not announced, but um, we're always looking for more, particularly for the verticals I said above, but also really just anything you want to build. Um, happy to talk. And yeah, my contact is brandon at zetachain.com. You can also contact partnerships at zetachain.com. Um, but yeah, if you want to get a conversation started, I'd love to chat, um, even just talk through ideas. Uh, for applications you want to build or um, understanding what is possible. And yeah, thank you for sticking through that with me. I will close out that initial talk um, and happy to answer any questions you guys have or um, go deeper on any topics I went over. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Brandon. That was really awesome. Uh, really appreciate covering all of all during this uh, workshop. So yeah, I mean, uh, now the floor is open uh, for any question that uh, the listeners may have. I mean, feel free uh, to type in public voice chat any questions that you may have, or you can just unmute yourself and uh, ask directly the the question. So yeah, 
floor now is yours. Okay, I see. Okay, uh, then uh, maybe I start. Um, yeah, sure. Thanks, thanks a lot, Brandon. Very interesting. Um, I was wondering, like, uh, I, I really don't understand the full complexity of, of the technology yet uh, of this interop interoperability. Um, so one of my questions is, if you are building something now on C.J. and you want to make an omni-chain application, uh, are there any special things you need to consider in terms of, let's say, long-term longevity uh, uh, availability of that application? Is, is there anything new that is um, especially um, risky uh, because it's interoperable, because it will be more dependent on many more things? Or, or what about that? Yeah, so I, I guess... It depends on what you want to build and the architecture you want to adopt. Um, we have, it, it, it might be worth taking a deeper dive into the, the docs and seeing what makes sense for you, depending on like what idea you're imagining. But uh, at a high level, the risk is um, not something like a bridge where once you build that, with a wrapped token um, and a vault that's backing it, then everything on the destination side backed by that vault is uh, you know, at, at risk and increased risk over time as more people are transferring assets through that bridge. Um, with cross-chain messaging, our cross-chain messaging actually allows you to transfer value by doing a two-sided swap, um, burning and minting Zeta. So you could swap X for Zeta, that would be burned, it would be minted on the destination, and then swapped for your target asset. So um, with that, again, the risk is only during the course of the transaction, and then um, the trust you have to have is in the network of Zeta chain so that it's sufficiently decentralized, um, etc. Kind of the similar trust assumptions of operating on any L1. Um, and yeah, if you are building with that messaging or with Omnichain smart contracts, uh, yeah, you're implicitly in, in investing or yeah, investing yourself in data chains longevity. So uh, of course, yeah, we're working super hard uh, to build out our validator network uh, and have it be something like a public good, like Ethereum, that has longevity over the next, you know, 10 plus years. So that's where we're aiming, but um, that's kind of the trust assumption you have to make. And then for smart contracts, yeah, there are certain systems where if you want a smart contract to custody uh, native assets of a user, like people deposit into your smart contract into a pool and earn yield on it or something like that, then it has similar risk to, I don't know, depositing in a pool on Ethereum, for example, where you know, if something is compromised in that system at some point, anywhere in, in that um, stack, like whether it's the underlying blockchain, whether it's the smart contract itself, or who's operating or who has um, access or admin privileges to that smart contract in some way, uh, that, that's the risk that you're putting users under or putting yourself under. Thanks a lot. Makes a lot of sense. Okay, there is another question from uh, TJ Godel. He's asking what security use cases are you seeing or thinking about for Zeta chain? Yeah, I guess, um, please follow up if I don't answer this question completely, but uh, our focus on the L1 level is security first. So, um, as with the previous question, the goal is to have a 
basically a default, very secure, very decentralized network that when you're deploying contract or um, contracts on other chains that are interacting with data chain, those are basically inheriting that uh, security blanket. Uh, security specific use cases, I guess you could go into privacy is where my head is going to. Um, I, I think there are a lot of use cases where you could use high computation of uh, chain like say like Solana or something like that uh, and then being able to do your zero knowledge or some sort of verification, validation proof or um, obfuscation and being able to output something to other chains uh, so you could like kind of like leverage high compute or cheap compute of certain blockchains and still be able to settle securely and privately on another chain something like that um, but yeah i'm not quite sure what you mean by security use cases Okay, so not sure if you can see the public voice chat, but yeah, I mean, uh, TJ Godel, uh, I'm sorry, he's uh, adding, I think uh, security is the ultimate use case for uh, Zeta chain. Got it. Um, TJ, let me know if I answered your question or not. Like, I'm happy to follow up if you um, have another question. Okay, great. Okay, yeah, so I mean, uh, if others have any question again, please feel free to unmute yourself or you can just type in public voice chat. I think you have covered everything, uh, Brandon, <laughs> given no more questions. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for everyone joining. I really appreciate the time. Yeah, I agree. If no question, I mean, uh, you can also connect with Brandon directly for any follow up questions that you may have. And yeah, I mean, uh, thanks uh, again, Brandon, for coming on this call. Really appreciate your time and uh, sharing all those uh, with, with us. It was really uh, valuable for us and all our members. And yeah, I mean, hopefully we'll see in other workshops. And thanks again. And also to everyone who joined this call today. Thank you. All right, take care. Bye.